our series is called A Blazing Grace, Another Look at the Old Testament Story. And today we are finishing up, well today and next week, we are finishing up stage two of this story, and that is the family. So we've gone through the beginning, and we've seen from God creating this world right through to the start of a covenant family that God was establishing, beginning with Abraham. And today and next week, we're going to finish that stage before we get into the Exodus. Now, to begin with, I want to bring your attention to a verse found in the New Testament. We're going to start our study of the Old Testament in the New Testament this week. And that is Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. Now, some of the verses will be on the screen, some will be in your Bibles. This one's on the screen, so you can choose for this one. And it says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you, and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. In biblical times, it wasn't very good to be a slave. Slaves... And slavery was a part of everyday life. Slaves were often treated more as property than people. They had basically no rights. Their freedom was gone. They did what they were told. They worked where they were told. Um, And often you can imagine a slave would work with a bit of a grudge. I'm here because I have to be here. But here we see the Apostle Paul instructing Christian slaves to have a whole different approach to their slavery, and there's a principle which, which we're going to draw out of this, which is a whole different approach to the way that we do life. And that is not to serve your master with your whole heart when, when they are watching only. That is not to serve your master um, out of fear, but to serve them with sincerity of heart and reverence, as if you are serving not just that person, whoever they are, if they're a good man or a good woman or a good... Um, and, or a bad person, whoever they are, whatever their character, don't just serve them, but through serving them, serve the Lord. The next verse, verse 23, says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. What would it look like if someone actually lived out this principle? If you took this principle, and I'm going to summarize it for you, and here it is, do all that you do with all of your heart for God. That's basically what the verse is saying, isn't it? This is a little bit easier to remember. And if you remember this line, you're basically going to remember the entire sermon. So take this line, lock it in your memory. This is what the sermon is about. Do all that you do with all of your heart for God. What would it look like if someone actually lived this out? From when they were young right through, if they actually lived this principle out in their life. And the answer is the story of Joseph. So we're going to go through the story of Joseph in two parts. This is going to take him from the pit through to the palace. And then next week, we're going to be looking at forgiveness and reconciliation. So let's, let's begin by, orient, um, by getting ourselves a bigger picture of the family through which Joseph came from. Okay? So first there was Jacob, and we've learned a lot about Jacob over the last couple of weeks. Jacob fell in love with who, do you remember? With Rachel. Jacob saw Rachel, and the moment his eyes laid upon her, he fell in love. And then he worked for seven years in order to get her as his bride. And then the wedding comes, the night comes, the morning comes, and what does he discover? It's not Rachel, but it's Leah good start to a, a marriage, isn't that? Okay, so Leah is there, and Jacob works for another seven years for Rachel. So now he has two wives, and you can imagine the, what sort of the family dynamics must have been here, when one of the wives was not really even wanted to be a wife in the first place, and the other one is the one who was really wanted, and so there was already this tension right from the beginning. Leah then goes on to have four children, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Now, do you think that would have made her feel better? Suddenly, being the unwanted wife, she's actually now the one who's giving Jacob lots of children, and and I can imagine she's starting to feel pretty good about this. Rachel looks on and goes, you know what? 
I'm not so keen about this. And in fact, I'm getting a bit jealous about this. So I've got a plan, Jacob. Have my servant Bilhah. Okay? And through Bilhah, have some children. Plan happens. Hang on, what have we done here? Two, two children, Dan and Naphtali. So now Rachel's getting back in the game. And Leah looks at him and goes, feeling a little bit threatened here. Not only am I, am I the unwanted wife, but Rachel's catching me. So Leah says, all right, Jacob, have my servant, Zilpah. Zilpah has two more, wi- two more children, um, Gad and Asher. Leah then has Issachar, Zebulun, and a young daughter by the name of Dina. Now, what do you think Rachel's feeling at this stage? <laughs> Not really keeping up with Leah, but then Rachel has her firstborn child by the name of Joseph. Now, Joseph was, by the, the, just the events that took place, it's very easy to see how he became the favorite. Okay? The firstborn child of, of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Then Rachel has a second child, um, Benjamin, and in the process, she passes away. So now, Jacob is left without his favorite wife, and all he has is two, two, two children, which is his, I guess, his part of her that, that remains. Now, would you say this is a recipe for a stable family life? Not very good, is it? Now, as, we go, as you go through the stories, and we're skipping through a whole bunch of chapters here, but we're going to see that things get even messier, and there's a whole lot of things that this family dynamic brought to, to life surrounding Joseph. Firstly, there was favoritism. Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, then Joseph was the favorite son because he was the firstborn of Rachel, his favorite wife. Favoritism. Secondly, Leah would have felt unwanted. Rachel then brought jealousy, and also, if you read through the stories, she stole a whole bunch of idols from her father, so she brought idolatry into the family as well. We go on, we see um, Dina threw up. She was raped in a pretty nasty sort of situation. And then in revenge, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story, but Simeon and Levi then go and slaughter a whole whole city in revenge when they're not feeling, the men of that city were not feeling overly comfortable. And if you want to go read that story, feel free. After this, we see Judah. He was tricked into sleeping with his daughter-in-law, who was pretending and deceiving him that she was a prostitute. And finally, if this wasn't bad enough, after Rachel died, Reuben slept with Rachel's servant, who was also Jacob's wife. What sort of family life would this have been? Like, when I give my family tree, it's like, okay, there's my dad, there's my mom, there's me, and my brother. Now, this has already taken us like 10 minutes to explain Joseph's family tree. This was a recipe. This was, the perfect, this was a perfect storm for conflict, for jealousy, for rivalry, for enemies, for hatred, and for violence. And this is where we find Joseph. And with Joseph, he became the center and the focus point of all of that hatred. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis Chapter 37 and verse 3. Genesis 37 and verse 3. Okay, it says, Now Israel, that's Jacob, Jacob's new name, Israel. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So here we see, because Joseph is the favorite, he's the one, Jacob then starts giving him preference in things. He starts spoiling him above and above all of the others. He's the the second youngest of the family, and so his father makes him this robe of many colors. And how does this make his brothers feel? 
they start getting stirred up. They're getting jealous. And if you think about the previous story with Jacob and Esau, what had happened? The birthright was skipped over Esau and it was given to Jacob. Now, what would the brothers be thinking? Could it be that our father is going to skip over all of us and give the birthright upon his favorite, Joseph? Surely they would be thinking this. And so the story goes on, and we get to a point where, where the, the older brothers are all tending the sheep in a place called Shechem. Now, Shechem was not the best place for them to be because that was the city that Simeon and Levi had destroyed. So the father, Jacob, is, is feeling a little bit concerned for, for all his sons. And so he gets Joseph and says, Joseph, I've got a task for you to do. I want you to go to Shechem and go and find your brothers, and when you find them, see how they're doing and report back to me. So Joseph puts on his robe of many colors, and he goes on a hike. And, and he goes to there, and he gets to Shechem, and his brothers aren't there. So then he goes over from Shechem down to Dotham. Now, by the time he gets to Dotham, Joseph has gone around about 100 kilometers. Okay, so this wasn't just a little walk down into the paddock and find your brothers. This was a long walk. And he's going to go and see about the welfare of his brothers. And his brothers look out in the distance, and they see this man coming, and they see a robe that is covering this man, and they know exactly who that is. And all that hatred that's been built up over the years, that's been passed down to them from their, from their mother, their mothers, suddenly comes to a climax here. And they start looking at him with utter hatred, and they think, you know what? Dad's a long way away. Maybe this is our opportunity to kill our son, and then we'll just, I mean, it's been a long journey. Anything could have happened with 100 kilometers. We'll just go back and tell his dad, tell our dad that something happened to him really bad. And so they get this plan that they're going to kill Joseph. But then one of the brothers speaks up and says, oh, let's not kill him. Like, that'll, get, well, that'll be pretty messy if we do that. Let's just throw him in a pit. We'll put him down the pit, and then we'll just, we'll just leave him. And then he can just die, in his, in his, as people do, if there's no food and that sort of thing. Pretty nasty sort of stuff. So Joseph gets picked up, and he gets thrown into the pit, and that's where we pick up our story. Genesis 37, verse 25. So Joseph has just been thrown in the pit. Verse 25 says, chapter 37, verse 25, Then they sat down to eat pretty heartless at this stage, aren't they? Joseph is in there. He's just a young boy. You can imagine he would have, it says earlier in the, in the chapter that he was 17 years old. You can imagine he, he was going through a terrifying situation. He knows that they don't, they're not going to pull him out. And in fact, they're almost gone too far now. They pulled him out and took him back to his father. Joseph's going to have a story to tell, and they're going to be in big trouble. And so the, the brothers, they're sitting around, and they're eating, wondering, oh, what are we going to do next? goes on, verse 25. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit, is, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. Here we have a, a noble idea. We can't kill him because he is our brother. And what they're really thinking is, you know what, what do we benefit out of killing him in this pit? He's actually a resource. We can sell him to these slave traders, these people selling all these different things, sell him to them and he can go down to Egypt and we'll never see him again. Verse 28, Then the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, they took Joseph to Egypt. Verse 36 says, Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him to, in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. This is a pretty bad situation that Joseph finds himself in. Firstly, his family is a wreck. He's, what about his self-worth? He has just been sold for 20 pieces of silver. And in fact, his brothers didn't even think he was worth that. They were willing just to get rid of him for nothing. 
Also, he's now in a foreign country. He's taken completely away from everything that's familiar to him, everything that he knows. And now he has, from being a loved and cherished son, he's now going to have to live out his life, not as a son, but as a slave for one of the officers of one, the most powerful man in the then known world. And the question we have today is, how do we respond when we come up against these kinds of hardships? How do we retain our sanity when everything around us is falling apart? And also, how do we serve God in the midst of a situation as terrifying and as bleak as this one? And of the excuse, people start putting up all these sorts of excuses. And they say things like, all right, God, I'm going to serve you, but let's just wait until my life gets back to some sort of normalcy. Okay, have you ever felt yourself saying things like that? Um, excuses get put up, all sorts of excuses. And what happens is, because of our situation, our circumstances, we start to feel like we are limited from really serving God. And there's a whole range of different things that might make us feel limited. You might be, think, I'm too young. We talked about it today. You might think, I'm too old. My family situation is too chaotic at the moment. I've got this going on, this going on. I'm too busy. I've got, I really want to serve you, God, but there's just too much going on in my life at this moment. And let's just wait until things settle down for a little bit, and then I'll get back to serving you. But what does Joseph do? Let me remind you our verse that we said that we started this whole thing off here, this whole thing off. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. In other words, do all that you do with all of your heart for God. And this is how Joseph responds to this situation. In the midst of being so limited that all he can do is be a slave, he says, You know what? I'm gonna do this with all of my heart. For God. And let's see what happens. Let's go to verse 39. So Genesis 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been bought, uh, brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, and an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, and who brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer of his house and over all that he had, had the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in, in house and in field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Here we see Joseph being unlike any other servant that Potiphar had ever had. Instead of being someone who, ha who worked with a grudge, who only did what they were told when the master was looking, who, who just sort of didn't really put everything into it, here was Joseph, and he lived his li out his life with integrity, with diligence, with excellence, and he did so serving God. And as he did this, things began to change in Joseph's life. He went from the bottom slave to the top servant, and then he was put over in Potiphar's entire house, and then he was put over everything that Potiphar had. Everything that he touched turned to gold. Joseph was limited in what he did, but what he did, he did with all of his heart for God. And what this shows me is this. Every situation that you find yourself in is an opportunity to serve God. Would you agree with that? How about this one? How we serve God is more important than what we actually do. Did we see that in Joseph's life? Here we have Joseph. He can't do much. But what stands out about Joseph is the way that he does what he does. 
So the question for you is, what is it that you do? Are you a student? Are you a teacher? Are you a tradie? Are you, are you grocery shopping? Are you stuck in traffic? Are you um, building a house? Are you driving? Or you, whatever it might be, what is it that you're doing? And the challenge that we get from Joseph is to take whatever it is that we're doing, our ordinary, everyday life, and give that to God as what we are doing to serve Him. Give that to God as our act of ministry. Give our everyday life to God as our act of worship. Now, if we do this, if we're truly doing all that we do with all of our heart for God, how will we know if we are being successful? How will we know if we are truly doing this? Well, let's look at Joseph's life. What happened when he started doing it? Blessing, 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 blessing. So if we are doing this, should we expect promotion? Should we expect a pay rise? Should we expect God to pour out his blessings upon us? Let's see what, what happens in the story. Verse, so chapter 39, verse 6 and 7. It says, So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. It goes on to say, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Verse 7. And after a time, his master's wife, that's Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. Here we see serving God with all of his heart leads him into a situation of crisis, a situation of conflict, a situation where he is being asked to do something that is outside of what God's will would be for him. Remember, Joseph is the person that says, do all that you do with all your heart for God. So he says, okay, as long as I'm doing it with all that I do, with all of my heart for God. Is that what he says? How could you do that for God? And what we see here is that in order to do all that we do with all of our heart for God, we have to do it in the context, in the framework of living out the principles of heaven. And when we do this, what's going to happen to our life? Let's see what happens to Joseph. Verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then I, can I do this great wickedness and sin against who? God. Here, Joseph had committed himself to serving God by serving Potiphar, but he recognized that ultimately the one that he was holding him, he was held accountable to, and the person he, serving was, he was serving was God. And in the midst of, of crisis, in the midst of temptation, Joseph realized that he was always in the presence of God, and the way that he lived and the way that he made those decisions, he had to do so with the principles of heaven. And let's keep going, let's see what happens after this. Verse... Uh, we're up to... 10. Okay, there we go. And he spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her to lie beside her, her or to be with her. So here we see Joseph now is making war against the temptations that are bombarding him. Amen. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were there in, he, in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. Trap is set. The house is empty. No one will know. What does Joseph do? But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Second time here we see in the story of Joseph, he has been stripped of his garment for quite different reasons. And the result? Similar things happened. Verse 13, And he, as soon as, as she saw that he had left her, his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He has come to me to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. Here we see suddenly, instead of um, Joseph being the one in the right, she calls out, Joseph has tried to violate me. And they race in, and Joseph is in a whole lot of trouble. 
and pretty soon Potiphar gets home, and the same story is relayed to, to Potiphar. And what happens? Verse 19 and 20. It says, As soon as his master heard the words that his wife had spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. What was the result of living out this principle? Promotion? Pay rise? Prison? Success? Success is not defined, success as living out this principle is not defined by promotion. Success is defined by how well we are aligning our lives with the will of God. How well we are being faithful to living out heaven's principles in the situation that God has left us in. So to remind you what I said before, how we serve God is more important than what we actually do. And another thing that is very similar, which applies to what we just read about here, is how we get somewhere is more important than where we actually end up. Joseph was successful, but he ended up in prison. But how did he get there? He got there with integrity, he got there with faithfulness, and he got there with purity. How we get somewhere is more important than where we actually end up. And things just got worse. Remember when we looked at the big family tree at the beginning, and we thought, how could, well, at least I thought, how could something get worse than this? Well, it just did. Psalm 105 verse 18 describes the situation of Joseph in here, and it describes it as this. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron. Sometimes you think about this prison that Joseph went to and think, oh, maybe it wasn't that bad. Maybe he had like this freedom and it was kind of a pleasant situation and Potiphar just put him somewhere where, it really, where he could kind of just pretend like he's done justice to his family and then kind of just looks after him in this prison. It was a bad situation that Joseph went into. His neck's in a collar of iron, his feet are in chains. What is he to do? How limited is he now? But remember, every situation is what? Every situation is an opportunity to serve God. And that is what, that is what he does. Let's go to Genesis 39, verse 22 and 33. It says, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of the prisoners who were, who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made him succeed. How did Joseph go from having his neck in a collar from the person that's overseeing the entire prison? Could it be that he did everything that he did with all of his heart for God? This is what it says in Patriarchs and Prophets. And this is a lesson to us. It says, He did not brood upon his wrongs, but forgot his sorrow in trying to lighten the sorrows of others. What an approach to a difficult situation that you find yourself in. Instead of wallowing in, Ah, oh, woe is me. Think about how you can lessen the woes of others. It goes on to say, He found a work to do even in the prison, Joseph gradually gained the confidence of his keeper of the prison and was finally entrusted with the charge of all the prisoners. Every situation is an opportunity to serve God. So Joseph is in there living out this principle and in come two men. Do you know who they are? There's the chief cupbearer and the chief Baker. Now, both of these people were people who worked in the palace of, of Pharaoh, and they come in there, and they're having a pretty rough day. But then they come across Joseph, and what was Joseph doing? He was trying, he wasn't worrying about his own sorrows so much as he was trying to relieve the sorrows of others. In 40, verse, 
uh, maybe I skipped that verse. Don't worry about that verse. <laughs> so here we have these two people, and Joseph goes in there. I do have it, actually. 40, verse 6 and 8. Let's go there. Chapter 40, verse 6 and 8. So Joseph is going through, doing his duties as a prisoner, looking after the prison, and he comes across the cupbearer and the baker. And this is what happens. Verse 6. Chapter 40, verse 6. When Joseph saw, came, came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Please tell them to me. How did Joseph find himself in this situation? He was going about doing all that he did with all of his heart for God, and he sees two men come in, and he looks at their faces, and he sees that their faces are downcast. He sees, and, and I'm sure he could relate to them, okay? He's had so many experiences, and he sees to them, and he comes and he empathizes with them. And he speaks to them, and he says, guys, what's going on? And they start telling him of their story. And then they tell him of these two dreams that they had. And, and Joseph being someone who had been, was in connection with God, had been given the gift of interpreting dreams. And so he goes, oh, well, dreams belong to God, and I'm going to seek God to answer your dreams. And so Joseph does that, and he gives the meaning of the two dreams that they had. One is in three days going to be ascended to the, the palace back once again, and the other one is going to be executed. And as he says this one to the cupbearer, that in three days you're going to the palace, he says, when you get there, make sure you remember me. Verse, chapter 41. After, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. How long? Joseph spends the next two years in prison. Now, how many things has Joseph done since he went to Egypt that you would say were unfaithful? And how many breaks has he got so far? Two long years in prison. And at this time, Pharaoh's sleeping, and he has this dream, and in this dream, there's seven um, good-looking cows that come out of the Nile River. And they come up on the land, and then following those seven good-looking cows, he sees seven scrawny, skinny cows that come up, and then those skinny cows devour and eat the big, the, the big fat cows. And this Pharaoh's just like, this is pretty strange. This is a pretty wild dream that I've got, but there's something about it that seems to be important. And so he brings in all of his wise men, and this is pretty familiar to other stories in the Bible as well, brings in all of his wise men, he brings them together, and he says, tell me what my dream means. And out of all of those people, no one can tell him what it means. The, the dream is just too wild, too crazy, too abstract. And you can imagine the cupbearer is just serving the Pharaoh in the background, listening in, listening in on these conversations, and where does his mind go? Oh, that's right. I know someone in prison who's faithfully helping people in prison, who knows how to interpret dreams, who I'm supposed to remember. And he's like, uh-oh, that's right. So they go and they grab Joseph, and they bring him to the palace. And let's see what happens. 41 verse 38. So Joseph, Joseph comes to the palace. The king says, this is my dream. Joseph says, okay, dreams don't belong with men, but dreams belong with God, and I'm going to interpret your dream for you. And this is the interpretation. Egypt's going to have seven years of plenty, really great rains. Farms are going to boom, but after that, we're going to have seven years of famine, seven years of need. And what we need to do is find a man who is wise, who we can put in charge of all of that, so that when we get to the seven years, we've, prov we've provided and stored up enough stuff so that we don't go hungry. And the king goes, hmm, I believe you. And I believe, and since you seem so wise, I'm going to believe in your judgment and find someone to oversee this whole situation. So, where are we? so 41 verse 38. It says, and Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is the Spirit of God? 
Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since you, God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. The king searched all over the land looking for a person whom he could trust this responsibility, or at least it in his mind, and he's thinking, my wise men, my officers, my commanders, my stewards. And he realizes that the most worth, the person who's most worthy, the most trustworthy person to entrust with this task is Joseph himself. I wonder how the king knew about Joseph's past record. Do you think that Potiphar, who worked with one of his officers, might have told him about him? Maybe the captain of the, the prison, who regularly probably was in communication with Pharaoh, would have told him the stories of how, Pharaoh, uh, how Joseph came into there and how he diligently helped others and how, even though he was a prisoner, he's actually basically running the whole shop. Joseph went from the pit, to the dungeon, to the palace. Because, and why was he entrusted to this? Because he first proved himself as a slave. He then proved himself in the cell. And now he was able to be trusted with the king's signet ring. Never underestimate the importance of a small task that God asks of you. What would have happened if Joseph didn't really put his heart into the little things that were before him in Potiphar's house? What would have happened if Joseph didn't put his heart into the little things that were put before him in the prison? Would he have been ready to be the man overseeing the great thing that God had call, called him to. Patriarchs and Prophets says this in relation to this. There are few who realize the influence of the little things of life upon the development of character. Nothing which we have to do is really small. The varied circumstances that we meet day by day are designed to test our faithfulness and to qualify us us for greater tasks. And what was that greater task that Joseph was being qualified to? Let's read our last verse. Math, uh, Genesis, last verse from Genesis 41, 56, and 57. It says, So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. How big is this task? Because Joseph was faithful in the little things, God put him over in charge of the big things. Because he helped people in the little things, he then was able to be put in a situation where he brought about salvation, not just to himself, not just to his family, not just to the king, but to the whole world kind of reminds us a little bit of this verse in Matthew chapter 25, doesn't it? His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. God is giving us little tasks, and every single one of us has tasks before us that we can do with all of our heart for God. And through those tasks, God is testing us, God is equipping us, and God is qualifying us for yet bigger tasks in the future. And the awesome thing about this is this is in the context of the second coming, this verse, which means that the bigger tasks that this is talking about go beyond even our life here on this earth. This is talking about eternity here. And our life here, we are being qualified, we are being equipped, we are being tested for the great and eternal jobs and responsibilities and tasks that God has laid up for us in the future. 
what are we doing with the little things that God has put before us today? So let's bring this... Never underestimate the importance of a small task. Let's bring this home for us today. What are your circumstances? What is the situation into which God has placed you? Can you relate to some of the situations that Joseph found in himself in? Can you relate with his family of conflict? Can you relate with him being forced to do things that he didn't really want to do? Can you relate to him being in a situation where he's being constantly bombarded with temptation? Can you relate to Joseph in the dungeon with a uh, um, shackle around his neck and around his feet? Forced into a terrible situation that he has, and he's done nothing wrong. I don't deserve this situation. Is that you? Or are, has life put you in such a place that you find yourself in a situation like Joseph in the palace? Wherever you are, the challenge for us today is to serve God in our situation, living out the principles of heaven, being peop- people who are noticed around because there is something different about us. Being people who, when people look at us, no matter what we're doing, God is glorified because we are living out God's principles and we are doing it to the glory of God. Are we doing all that we do with all of our heart for God? But why should we do this? Why should we live a life like Joseph for God? And the answer is because Jesus lived a life like Joseph for us. Have you ever noticed the similarities between the story of Joseph and the story of Jesus? Joseph was taken away from his family, his comfort zone. Jesus was taken away, left his family from heaven and came down to this earth. A distant, foreign place. How many coins was Joseph sold for? 20. How many coins was Jesus sold for? 30. The path to greatness for Joseph involved going down in order to go up. The path of Jesus involved going down in order to go up. You just need to read Second Corinthians, I mean Philippians 2, um, from verse 5 onwards. And we see Jesus steps down, 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 human, humbled himself as a servant, humbled himself as dying, as dying, and then humbled himself to the death of a cross. Jesus went down, 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 down. Joseph began his role in the palace at age 30. What time did Jesus begin his ministry? Age 30. What was Jesus doing in the lead up to that? Was he going around with big crowds of people? Was he doing great miracles? Jesus was doing the ordinary things of life. Jesus was doing all that he did with all of his heart for God through, the, through being a carpenter. That's a pretty regular job. And what was the result of this life? Joseph brought salvation through feeding, through bringing food to the whole world, and Jesus brought salvation by bringing forgiveness to the whole world. And who did Joseph do it for? Did his family care for him? But he brought salvation to them. Did the people in Egypt care for him? But he brought salvation to them. Joseph brought salvation to a, to a world that cared nothing of him. What about Jesus? Jesus came down to this world and he died for us who cared nothing of him. And on the cross he looked out and said, Father, forgive them, his murderers. He brought forgiveness to the ones who wanted him dead. So our challenge today is to do all that we do with all of our heart for God. Why should we do it? Because Jesus did all that he did with all of his heart for us. Yes, I like it. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to be more like Joseph. Amen. Lord, you made us, oh, we pray that you'll help us to make you our cornerstone, Lord. Help us to make you our everything because you made us your everything, Lord. Help us to remember this principle that to do all that we do with all of our heart for you. Lord, life throws us so many challenging things. But Lord, help us to be faithful in the little things. 
in the small things, the things that seem insignificant. And Lord, as I read, read through and we look at this story, it just makes me wonder how many other Josephs there are in this world that you've called. People that you called to great things, but they never achieved them because they failed in the little things. Lord, may that not be our experience. Help us to be people who live out your principles, Lord, in the everyday. Help us to do all that we do for you. And Lord, we thank you so much for doing all that you did with all of your heart for us. Be with us now as we go out into the rest of our day, into our week, and into our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.